Now, invasive hemodynamics is an important topic, and uh, probably it's more important for the exam now in real life because we don't use cath lab uh, hemodynamics. Uh, I mean, cath lab based hemodynamics a lot, like before. But it's important because it shows us how we can uh, read uh, the, the hemodynamics, how we consolidate the pathophysiology and stuff like that. That's why it remains an appealing subject for the exam more than in real life. Okay. Now, of course, you know the swan gas. Okay. And uh, Swan Gans is a catheter that is pushed from the right atrium into the RV to the pulmonary artery and right into the uh, wedge, pulmonary artery. And after you reach the pulmonary artery, wedge it by inflating the balloon. So these are the tracing you are going to get. A right atrial pressure tracing, right ventricular pressure tracing, pulmonary artery tracing, and, and the wedge tracing. The wedge reflect, uh, reflects the left atrial pressure uh, hemodynamics, okay? So this is exactly what you get. And this is, uh, you have to familiarize yourself with the way the hemotracings uh, uh, look like and this stuff. The most important part of the this one gas is that while you are pushing it through, sometimes you can find difficulties, especially if you have TR and PR. Okay. And the hardest part of all this is which part? Yani to position it in the right atrium, RV, pulmonary, or which? Which is the hardest? Which is the one most prone to error in the positioning? In the pulmonary artery and the wedge. The wedge, exactly. Because uh, as you go here, this is kind of automatic, you know, it's spontaneous. You are pushing down and, and it goes here, it goes to artery, it goes to pulmonary, it goes to the pulmonary artery. But when you wedge, are you wedging in the right place or no? That is the problem. So sometimes you need to make sure that you are wedging in the right site. Okay, that's the only thing. Uh, or probably this is the most critical site of the uh, Usman gas. Now, uh, this is how the LV pressure tracing looks like. Okay, so you have a diastolic bottom and a systolic peak. And this is up stroke and you have down stroke. And you have this diastolic curve and it is started over again. If we superimpose an aortic pressure on that, we will have a systolic start, systolic pressure, then up stroke, then peak, then dichrotic notch, then diastolic pressure, okay? And if, if you look at the peak here, the peak of the LV and the peak of the aorta coincides, right? They coincide because there is no pressure gradient between the two. Assuming that under physiological condition, we don't have aortic stenosis. So the peak LV pressure is transmitted wholly and without any resistance to the peak aortic pressure. That's why there is no gradient. Okay, so that is physiological. So you have just to acquaint yourself with these waves and how they look like, okay? As to the left atria, we have A and what else do we have? A, after A we have C, we have V and we have X and then we start over again. I'm going to give a dedicated part to this uh, session to the left atrial pressure tracing. But as of now, just focus on how 
the aortic and left ventricular pressure look like. Now, the wedge is from the pulmonary artery. The left atrial pressure tracing, you can obtain it directly from the left atrium and indirectly from the witch. Okay? But the standard is the LA pressure tracing are obtained by which? Why? Why not from putting a catheter in the left atrium? In this case, the pressure tracing is going to be more crisp. Uh, I mean, less artifacts and more accurate in terms of timing and uh, pressure tracing. So why are we using wedge instead? It's more invasive when to... Exactly. The exactly. system is more invasive. Definitely. It is way less invasive than left atrial pressure tracing. Because if you have to get a left atrial pressure tracing directly, you have to pierce the septum from the right side. And piercing the septum is invasive. Invasive. Yeah? So that's why the wedge is the, the standard. Okay. Now look here. Uh, I'm using the central ascending aorta catheter and femoral artery catheter. There are two terminologies you have to get used to. One is simultaneous tracing. The other is pullback tracing. The simultaneous tracing means we have more than one catheter at more than one location or chamber obtaining the pressure simultaneously at the same time. So I have a catheter or two. While pull back, I'm using a single catheter. And I'm just pulling back from one chamber to the next, to the third, to the fourth. Okay? So, now, if you have a tracing like this, that means I have two catheters. If you get a tracing that looks like this, uh, okay, just a moment. LV, 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 then aorta, aorta aorta and goes like that, that means it is a single catheter pulled from the LV to the LVOT to the aorta to the distal aorta and downwards. Okay. But here I have two catheters. That means we have simultaneous tracing here, which is LV pressure tracing with aortic pressure tracing. Now this is obtained from the central ascending aorta, and this is from the femoral aorta artery uh, for the same patient. Look at the difference. What is the difference between the two tracing? This is the same patient, but different tracing. Can you tell me about the difference first? What difference do we see here? If we look at the gradient, peak to peak gradient here, this one, compare it with peak-to-peak -peak gradient here. Yeah. Which one is more? In the femoral artery. Yeah, the femoral artery, the gradient is more or less? Um, the gradient is less. Mm -hmm. gradient is less. Exactly. The gradient is less. You are so right. Because the peak aortic pressure or the, the peak femoral pressure is more. There is no difference in this part. This is LV. But the difference here in the aortic versus femoral, the femoral peak systolic pressure is more than the central aortic peak pressure. Why is that? Why is that? Because it's the... Resistance is more. The peripheral resistance is more, and the vessels became narrower and more thicker. Okay, good. 
So I'm gonna fast forward you to one slide before we carry on. You see here, yeah, exactly. This is physiological. It's called the peripheral augmentation of the pulse and the blood pressure. As you go down from the heart, from the central aorta, the blood pressure or the pulse rate and the blood pressure as represented here looks like that. So you have increasing systolic, steeper upstroke, decreasing diastolic and sharp, uh, less sharp diacrotic notch. The most important thing is this part, increasing systolic compared to the central aorta. This is as you go down, brachial, radial, femoral, dorsalis, pedis, as you go down, okay? And that's why if you measure the blood pressure in the upper limb, compare it to the lower limb, the lower limb will give you more readings, higher readings, okay? Because of the peripheral augmentation of the blood pressure, peripheral augmentation of the blood pressure. Why the peripheral augmentation? Physiologically, that's because of this. If you see here, this is the upstroke, okay? And then we have up until here in the pulse is called the forward wave. That's the wave generated by the stroke volume the contractility of the heart and the push of blood out of the LV. It forces the blood to achieve a pressure up to here, but we have it up to here. So this one is generated by a different force, this part. This force is the reflected wave. As the blood moves through the vessel, waves are reflected back and that increases the pressure. So the part from here, until here is called the augmentation pressure. So this is augmented pressure due to the reflected waves. So if we go back here, as you go down, come on sensically, you have more of reflected wave. That's why you have more of systolic pressure. You have more of augmented pressure. That's why you have more of systolic pressure as you go down because as you go down the blood flowing down the vessel more reflected wave builds up more systolic pressure builds up okay so this is important um, physiological concept which is the peripheral augmentation of the pulse and the blood pressure that is why if we go back the femoral artery systolic pressure is higher than the central aortic pressure. And that's why it's gonna lead to a lower pressure gradient between the LV and the femoral artery. Bitali, the femoral artery, if you use your sheath or your catheter is the femoral artery and you are checking for aortic stenosis, that is gonna underestimate or overestimate the gradient. Is it gonna underestimate or overestimate the gradient? Exactly, it's going to underestimate the gradient because the gradient is the difference between the LV systolic, which is equal in between the two, and the peak arterial pressure, which is more in femoral artery than central aorta. That's why the difference is less in the femoral artery than in the central ascending aorta. That is why a femoral artery is going to underestimate the aortic stenosis gradient. And the same applies to all peripheral arteries. The radial artery is also gonna underestimate. That's why the standard, if you are checking for aortic stenosis, is to measure the pressure between the LV and the central aorta, proximal aorta, okay? I want to ask you a question. There are some times when the femoral artery, if used for aortic stenosis, it can overestimate the gradient. Can you tell me which situation are these? Quartization of the aorta. Okay, and? Quartization of the aorta is a right answer because in coarctation, you will probably have a lessel lesser blood flow, lesser blood pressure in the radial and downward, I mean in the femoral and downward. This is one, and the other is? 
of clavian artery stenosis? Any stenosis, any peripheral stenosis. Yani, uh, femoral artery is a peripheral vessel, okay? So it can be inflicted by peripheral artery disease. You can have femoral artery atherosclerosis with stenosis. In this case, the pressure will be low and the difference between LV and the femoral artery, if it's atherosclerotic and stenosed, is gonna be high. So it's gonna be uh, overestimating the gradient. That's why you better uh, steer away from the femoral artery. Because if it's open, it's going to underestimate the gradient. And if it's atherosclerotic, it's likely overestimate the gradient. So the central and ascending aorta is the reference point. Okay, now the second question is, if you look at the one here, side hole and end hole catheter. In the end hole, look at the pressure. Difference, compare it to the pressure difference here. So what do we have? Is it more or less in end hole compared to side hole catheter? More. more. It is more. It is more. Yeah. Anybody can explain that? Uh, because in end hall, uh, the pre uh, the pressure it reading the inside hall there is. Uh, Uh, it reading it reading the, the the pressure after the end and before the end inside hole. Okay. Okay. Uh, you are close. Let mm -hmm. look, let me, let me go side hole. That means what? Another end hole and side hole. But the end hole is only end hole. There is no side hole. So the one with end hole, yani a single hole, which is just at the end. It is prone to what? Damping. It is prone to damping. You are prone to come against the wall. So that's why here the aortic pressure has damped. And that's why you get high gradient. That high gradient is erroneous because of the damping of pressure, because of the use of end hole catheter. But if you use side hole catheter, if the end hole is against the wall, you have the other one, which is not damping. So there will be no damping. That's why the standard for aortic stenosis or for hemodynamics in general is the side hole catheter. So now we know if we are talking about or checking for aortic stenosis, we go for LV, aortic pressure tracing, not femoral and we use side hall catheter. Now, I want one of you to uh, explain to us this signal versus this signal. Yes, we know this is fixed obstruction of aortic stenosis, and this is dynamic obstruction of hookup. Can anybody explain this and this? In case of aortic stenosis, there is slow rising. Slow rising, good. This is the slow rising. The slow rising means you have a, a time lag. Okay, time lag between the up stroke of the LV and the up stroke of the aortic pulse. So this time lag. This time lag, it has a name, which is pulses Tardus. Tardus means delay, delay, tardus. So delayed upstroke of the aortic pulse. One, two. What else? In case of uh, uh, of the second, in case of hookah, there is uh, a spike and doom and the pulse is... Uh, Very then... good. Here, the pulse looks like a spike, which is here. This is the spike. 
Okay, I'm gonna follow it. And the dog. Okay, so it looks like this. You have a spike and dome. You agree? It's a spike and dome. A spike and dome is characteristic of hookum. Okay. Good. So, if you have a pulse that looks like a spike and dome, and there is no delayed upstroke between the aortic pulse and the LV, this is more of hookum. Because in aortic stenosis, when it is severe, you get this tardus, you get this tardus, delayed uprise of the aortic pulse. And you see the upstroke is kind of, kind of, what? Irregular. You see this one? This R, which is called an acrotic R, is irregular. You see this irregularity? That is also because of severe aortic stenosis. It can also be in severe aortic regain. Uh, it's probably because of, you know, high push, high force. Again, it's fixed it's genotic leaflet. So it leads to this kind of flutter kind of the upstroke of the pulse. You see here the pulse is smooth rising. This is called an acrotic pulse because it showed this one. In terms of gradient, which is the difference between this one here and this one here, this is called peak to peak gradient. And here also, from here to here, this is the peak pressure gradient. Okay. Now for the peak to peak pressure gradient, which is measured in the cath lab, What is the echo equivalence of peak to peak pressure gradient? Mean gradient. And mean gradient. Okay. Any other opinion? Any spontaneous? Sorry. Peak instantaneous. Both of pressure. Peak. The peak pressure gradient, which is the, the maximum, the maximum pressure we get by echo. The right answer, I wish to hear from you here, is that there is no echo equivalence of peak to peak pressure gradient. There is no. In echo, we have the peak or the maximum pressure gradient, which is sometimes called maximum instantaneous pressure gradient. And we have the mean pressure gradient. But the peak pressure gradient has no equivalence. Why it has no equivalence? Because it is non-physiological. Yani if you are measuring this one and this one, these two pressures are taking place in different timing. This is, is taking place in this time. If you see, if I, I plot it again, it's the time. The time is going to be somewhere here. And this one, the time is going to be here. In echo, we are measuring exactly the same time. The same time, the LV aortic, the LV pressure and the aortic pressure at the same time. That's why it's called maximum or peak instantaneous pressure gradient. But in CAR, the peak to peak is non physiological. I should keep the equivalence in echo. Like in Agrip Hajalehu, here, peak instantaneous uh, pressure gradient in echo. Agrab hajala. Agrab hajala. Okay. And mean, where is the mean pressure gradient? The mean pressure gradient he, it is here. This part. All this part. I'm going to shade all this part, which is the mean. And there is a way to calculate the mean by cat using Gorlin equation which uses the stroke volume, uses the, the systolic period, and uses the, uh, these kind of stuff, they get the mean here. The mean is equivalent to the hour mean in, in echo. But the peak to peak has no equivalence. The closest to it is the peak instantaneous. Okay. Now, anybody? Okay, you can take it. Huh? Yes. Uh, in 
ISA. This is uh, simultaneous hemodynamic tracing uh, of the LT and aorta tracing from 0 to 160. Uh, there is uh, a gradient between the aorta and the LV. Yes. With uh, a gradient around uh, between 120 to 140, around between one, uh, 100 minus 140, about 40 gradient, fixed okay. gradient. Yes. And uh, there is uh, a BBC after it. There is increased pause in the LP pressure and aortic pressure with the same gradient. Okay. Uh, the peak between 100 to uh, 100. Uh, to 100 less than around 40 or 50. Like they return back to normal after the BPCs. This is a, this is a, looks like fixed of obstruction of aortic stenosis. Okay. Type, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Arbach, if you allow me, you mentioned correctly that you have a gradient which has increased after the PVC. Okay. Uh, what else? in the pulse pressure, if we compare the pulse pressure, this one, to the pulse pressure before the PVC, which is here, what happens? Uh, the pressure in the LV and the aorta both are increasing. Mm -hmm. But yes. the LV uh, diastolic pressure is decreasing. Oh, yes, good. The LV diastolic pressure is decreasing. And what about the... Uh, the the, the aortic, aortic also decreasing. The aortic what systolic pressure increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Increasing, exactly. Both the LV and the aorta increasing. Yes, you are right. So after the PVC, on the PVC, by the way, it does two effects. One is it increases the volume because of more time for the filling and it increases the contractility. Okay. As far as Hukam is concerned, and I wish you focus with me in this. As far as Hukam is concerned, the more volume in the LV, the less the pressure, right? The less volume, the more the pressure. Because the contract, the obstruction is LV cavity dependent. If it's getting smaller, with this junk of muscle, you know, okay? But as the contractility increases, the obstruction increases. So the, the PVC seemingly has two canceling forces. One is to increase the pressure, and one is to decrease the pressure in hookum. To increase the pressure in hookum by means of increasing contractility, and to decrease the pressure in hookum by increasing the LV diastolic volume. But the force of contractility overwhelms the force of increasing the volume. That's why in hookum, after the PVC, the pressure increases because of increasing contractility, which is more potent or more powerful effect than increasing volume. Remember this one, okay? Now, if we look at fixed, fixed aortic stenosis, we have the gradient here. After the PVC, we have more contractility. This more contractility has increased the systolic aortic pressure. But at the same time, it has also increased the pressure gradient. So the pressure gradient increased after the PVC. But the increase in the systolic pressure has led to a prolongation in pulse pressure as compared to the preceding beats. 
So there is prolongation in the pulse pressure or lengthening of the pulse pressure. Now, if we have hookum, we have the baseline pressure, which is this one, this one, and this one. This is the baseline pressure. See, after the PVC, the gradient increases that much. But it is associated with what? With a decrease in aortic peak pressure, aortic systolic pressure. Why aortic systolic pressure drops? It drops because the contractility has led to severe obstruction, decreasing the cardiac, uh, de decreasing the stroke volume that fills the aorta. So you have a drop in systolic pressure. And that's why the pulse pressure gets narrow compared to the preceding beats. So you look at the pulse pressure here. Okay. So you can add. Nagul, what is the difference between fixed aortic stenosis and who come as to this kind of tracing? In both, there will be increase in gradient. In both, increase here, increase here. So this increase is no distinguishing feature. So don't say it increases more in who come than, no. They increase in both conditions. So this is not a distinguishing feature. The distinguishing feature is the pulse pressure. The pulse pressure prolongs in fixed aortic stenosis and shortens in hookum. And the shortening of the pulse pressure in hookum, along with the increase in the gradient, is called brocom prosine. So the brocom prosine is not the increasing gradient after the PVC. No, it's increasing the gradient and decreasing the pulse pressure. Because the increasing the gradient alone is not, a, is, not, is not going to tell you apart these two conditions. You have to have a narrow pulse pressure as compared to a longer pulse pressure. Okay? You get the point here? Okay? Is that clear? That's clear. Okay. Now, what do we see here? Uh, if you have aortic stenosis, you have probably three or four scenarios that you have a patient with normal ejection fraction, and you manage to elicit a mean gradient more than 40 with an area less than one. So this is severe aortic stenosis with normal ejection fraction, right? Sometimes the patient had low ejection fraction, low ejection fraction, but you still manage to elicit a mean gradient more than 40, an area less than one. What's the meaning of this? Severe aortic stenosis. And you are lucky to elicit a mean gradient of 40 despite low blood pressure. In these two scenarios, you are lucky because you have no trouble, need no further workup. But the problem arises when you have a patient with low ejection fraction and low gradient, but the area is less than one. So morphologically, you are suspecting severe aortic stenosis and you fail to elicit a mean gradient more than 40, probably because of the low flow, probably because of the low ejection fraction. This is called low flow, low gradient, low AF, low EF, aortic stenosis, okay? So you have come across this one a lot, I guess. So it is low flow. So the flow is low because the gradient is flow dependent, right? So we have the flow is low. 
the gradient is low and the EF is low. That makes sense because the assumption goes like this. The low gradient is due to low flow and the low flow is due to low EF. Okay. Sometimes you have a patient of low flow. The flow is low. The gradient is low because of the low flow, but the ejection fraction is normal. How come? Yes, it is because of how come. That is why it's called paradoxical AF. Paradoxical AF that does not make sense immediately because we assume, we assume that once the ejection fraction is normal, we have normal flow across the valve. But sometimes the ejection fraction is normal, but we have low flow. That's why it's called paradoxical aortic stenosis. So we have two scenarios here. Low flow, low gradient, low EF. Low flow, low gradient, normal EF. Okay. So what are we going to do for the low flow, low gradient, low EF? What do we do for it? Uh -huh. Exactly. Exactly. So remember, the low flow, low gradient, low EF is for the vitamin echo. What we are, what are we going to do for? What are we going to do for low flow, low gradient, normal EF? Uh, stroke volume index. Very good. Very good. The basic definition or definitional feature in the paradoxical AS is that if you have normal ejection fraction, you have to tell everybody on board that I have low flow. Because we assume that once we have normal ejection fraction, we have normal stroke volume. But now you are telling us you have a paradoxical situation in which you have normal ejection fraction and low flow. So you have to give us more objective information. The objective information you need to drive from echo is the stroke volume index. You have to calculate the stroke volume index by echo, and you have to show us that it is less than 35 ml per meter square. If it is less than 35 ml per meter square, we might believe that this is low flow, low gradient, normal EF, paradoxical AS. Okay? Now, if you demonstrate that you have possibly paradoxical AS, what are you going to do about it? Dubitamine? Are you going to do dubitamine? No. Uh -huh. We'll do calcium scoring. Very good. Very good. So according to the guidelines, if you have paradoxical AS is, is a part, is a confusing part, okay? So the recommendation is to go for coronary calcium scoring by cardiac CT. And if you find that calcium score is high, there are some special threshold for males and females that tilt the balance to our severe aortic stenosis, truly severe aortic stenosis. There is also a recommendation to measure the dimensionless index. And the dimensionless index is what? Is the LVOT, LVOT velocity, which is TVI, LVOT TVI over, over what? Divide oh. by. Aortic, yes, mm -hmm. aortic TVI. Why did they select this measurement in particular to be reflective of the true status 
of paradoxical AS. Because it, uh -huh. it yes, go ahead. Uh huh. Very sensitive, and it what? not depends on the hemodynamics. Yes, because it is the one that is not affected that by the flow. Because if I have a flow problem, I am going to have the same problem below and above the valve, or below and at the valve. So I will have the same problem in the LVOT. So if I get this this ratio and it is still less than 0.25, that is more into severe, okay? Because if I have a low stroke volume, this low stroke volume is going to affect the, this part and this part equally. So in paradoxical AS, you have to do the dimensionless index and you probably need to ask for cardiac CT. Back to low flow, low gradient, low EF. We said we need dobutamine. This dobutamine, by the way, is mainly done by echo. But sometimes we can do it by cath. Okay, and here it's done by cath. See the baseline. The gradient is 22, 28. The area is 0.7. After dobutamine, the gradient jumps to 42, the area remains 0.7. So what's your verdict here? Is it true stenosis or pseudostenosis? True stenosis. It is true stenosis. Good. Look here. I have a baseline gradient of 22, an area of 0.7. With dubitamine, the gradient goes to 24, and the area opens up to 1.2. Is it true aortic stenosis or pseudo aortic stenosis? This is pseudo. Exactly, because the area opens up under the stroke volume. And they're increasing the stroke volume, the aortic area opens up. Manata, it was basically a flow problem, you know, and now the area increased because one important requirement or condition that it is severe is that the area remains the same or remains below one and the gradient increases. So we have to have increasing gradient while the area remains the same. If we have high gradient, but the area goes more than one, that is not true in severe stenosis. Okay? So this same data is collected by ECHO. So by ECHO and CAF, we do the same uh, kind of data. Now, if I show you this one, this is a bit tough, but uh, you know Nishimura, who is really uh, one of the big guns and guidelines and uh, task force of valve disease. And if you look here, this is a patient of a mean gradient of 32. And aortic valve area of 0.9. The ejection fraction in this patient was 60%. So what was this one? It was paradoxical AS. They assume that this is paradoxical AS. What have they done? They gave nitroprusside. When they gave nitroprusside, the pressure increases. The mean, I mean the, the peak to peak pressure increases to 45 and the area remains 0.9. Can you explain to me that? Mm. Nitroprocyte is uh, mm. after, after, lo after load reduced. Okay. So it increases the gradient across the valve. Why? Because it decreases the afterload. Okay. Decreasing the afterload is going to impact what? What? Peripheral practice? resistance. Huh? Peripheral resistance decrease. Uh, yes, the peripheral resistance decrease, but why the gradient increases? Uh, because of decrease afterload. Decrease after load. And decrease after load is going to improve what? 
is going to improve the stroke volume, right? Yes. Exactly. We said in the paradoxical AS, we have a problem of flow. We have a problem of flow, right? We have low flow despite normal ejection fraction. So what if we drop the afterload and see the impacts of afterload reduction on the stroke volume? The stroke volume increases. And by the increase in the stroke volume, the flow increases. And by the increase of the flow, the gradient increases. Yes. Exactly. Here in the Arfin, al mushkila fil paradoxical AS. And that's they think, why? Why do we have a patient with normal ejection fraction or super normal ejection fraction with low stroke volume? Le, ghalib al patient al indahum paradoxical AS, ghalibahum, indahum advanced grade of diastolic dysfunction. They have uh, moderate to severe left ventricular hypertrophy. They tend to be more of uh, females than males. So they think that the problem is probably it starts at the diastolic phase, that the diastolic filling was a problem. And we know from Starling law, you remember the Starling law? The Starling law, the force of contraction depends on the force of relaxation or the degree of relaxation. So if you have a problem in the, in, in the relaxation and in the diastolic phase, that's going to affect the systolic phase. Okay? So that's the theory about the paradoxical AS, that they are probably having a diastolic dysfunction leading to impaired filling and therefore leading to impaired flow in systole. So if I increase, if I do anything that's going to enhance the relaxation by decreasing the afterload, for example, I might improve the output. And here we are. We have improved the stroke volume and we reveal a true gradient which was high. Okay, but it's still not in the guidelines. So in the guidelines, don't ever answer that you need to do cat based hemodynamics for a patient of paradoxical AS. Paradoxical AS, what you have to do is you correlate the clinical picture with the echo data. You do whatever you can do in echo. You do the dimensionless index and you do the calcium scoring by cardiac CT. Okay? Good. <clears throat> now, this is a patient of Hukum. At baseline, and after giving small dose and high dose of isoprop, Isoproterinone. What is the effect of isopro? It is alpha beta stimulator. So it acts in a way like exercise. So at the baseline, what we get is hardly any gradient. But as we increase the dose of isopro, we start to have high gradients. Gradient. Okay, high grade. So this is called provocable or inducible gradient. So you can have in Hukum, you can have a ref gradient. Sometimes you don't, and you need to provoke it and see how much if the patient is symptomatic. If the patient is symptomatic, but you fail to elicit high gradient during rest study of echo, you might do exercise echo or exercise or uh, pharmacological stress uh, a cash uh, based hemodynamics to elicit or provoke high gradients. Okay, you can do that. Now, look here, this is the same patient. We have a mean mitral valve gradient of 15 here by using wedge catheter, and we have having a mean pressure of six by using LA pressure uh, tracing. Where is the mean gradient? The mean gradient is this one, this shaded area. I'm gonna shade the area. This is the mean mitral 
ball gradient. It's this one. It is between the mitral gradient and the LV diastolic face. And here it, is it here, here it is. Okay. So why? Why do we get a mean of 15 by using which and a mean of six by using LA catheter? Why? The one we said that the standard in the wedge, the standard for LA pressure is wedge pressure. Not LA pressure because LA pressure is invasive. But I might take you here. Look here. This is LA pressure. And this is the wedge. Look at the wedge when it comes. It comes later than the LA pressure. Why it comes later? Because you have a catheter in the pulmonary artery that is measuring the LA pressure. So it takes time for the LA pressure to reflect in the wedge catheter. So you have delayed timing. You have delayed timing. But if you have the same catheter, the pressure catheter, in the left atrial cavity is going to pick up the gradients or the pressures immediately. There is no time lag. And this time lag is the source of the problem. If we go back here, this time lag comes, leads to a false impression of a high gradient here. But because it comes late, I have to move the wedge up this way. I have to move it this way. If I move it this way, I'm going to minimize the gradient because it has come late, but this is not true. It has to be shifted left war okay that's the problem of timing but if you use the la you see this one this is the v wave right the v wave the the peak of v wave should correspond to the peak of the pressure here and the down stroke the down stroke of the lv should come with the down stroke of the v wave which is at the y the y you remember the a, C, V, Y. Yeah, this is Y. Okay. This one is Y. The Y down stroke correspond to the LV down stroke. But look here. Where is the V wave? It's coming here. Why the actual V wave is supposed to be somewhere here. This arm is coming so away from what it's supposed to be with, which is here. That's why it is delayed timing leading to impression of high gradient. So be careful with the use of wedge. You might overestimate the gradient just because of this time lag. So you have to shift the wedge back in place and reevaluate the gradient. Okay? Good. Now, look at this patient here. At rest and exercise. The mean gradient is eight and pulmonary artery wedge pressure is 18. After exercise, the gradient, the mean gradient is 29 and the wedge is 41. So what do you think here? So what's the problem here? Tachycardia. Yes, there is tachycardia. Yeah. But what do you draw? What calculation you draw from this hemodynamics about the severity of mitral stenosis? Uh, is it severe? Yes, why not? That is 
clinically significant mitral stenosis because after exercise, the mean gradient jumped to 28 and the wedge jumped to 41 from a baseline of 8 and 18 respectively. So that means that this mitral stenosis is really significant. But the question is, why have we done exercise hemodynamics in the first place? A patient with mitral stenosis, why should I go for exercise? Why should I go? If there is discordance between the clinical status and the echo data, that's the indication. And usually the discordance is like this. The patient is symptomatic, but the mitral stenosis by echo is mild, moderate. Okay? In this case, you go for exercise because you wanna evaluate the symptoms more objectively and you wanna try to correspond if the patient's symptoms are going or matching or corresponding to a higher gradient elicited by exercise or not. Okay? Yeah, if, 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 if a patient, this is a real dilemma because sometimes you get a patient who is obese and he has physical unfitness, he has so many reasons to be shortness of breath. And you find that he had moderate stenosis. So are you gonna intervene? Okay, the intervention is okay, but you have to make sure that you are intervening in the right patient because you have to make sure that the mitral ballooning you are planning to do is going to improve the patient's symptoms. It does make no sense if you fix the mitral stenosis and the patient's symptoms remain. So you have to make sure that these, this kind of symptoms relates to this mitral stenosis. And I can do that in the exercise lab, either invasively or non-invasively. So if the patient gets shortness of breath, at the same time, I see that the wedge has increased and the mean pressure has increased. That is mitral stenosis leading to this patient's symptoms. So I might intervene in this particular patient. Okay? Type. Remind you, this is a invasive hemodynamics. So how could we do exercise during cath lab, while we are doing invasive hemodynamics, how are we gonna exercise the patient? Mm -hmm. Any idea? It is by bicycle ergometer. You know, the patient on the bed and there is a bike at his feet. So he's exercising there without messing up with the upper part, which we are, uh, you know, working on. So that's the setup. The setup is bicycle ergometer, okay? Even in Ecolab, bicycle ergometer is thought to be better than the treadmill because it, 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 it avails you of the opportunity of doing Echo at the same time the patient is exercising. Because the problem of treadmill, even in echo, is that the patient reaches the peak exercise and then you have to take him from bed, I mean from the from the treadmill to the bed, and then you put him, position him for echo. During this time, you might lose the heat of the moment, the heat of the exercise, okay, might be lost. So bicycle ergometer is the best setup for cath lab and echo as well for this kind of hemodynamics, okay? Look at the other patient, at rest and at exercise. Look at the gradient. It is very small gradient. Mitral stenosis gradient is very, 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 very small. Maybe it's like three, four. It goes a little bit higher to maybe five, something like that. But the most important thing is that the wedge from 13, it goes to 41. What's your explanation of this? So is it severe mitral stenosis? 
like the previous patient or something else? Mm -hmm. This is what? Any guess? You think you can answer just the first part. Do you think it's because of white stenosis? No. So we know that this patient is having mild mitral stenosis, which remains mild mitral stenosis by the gradient after exercise. So why the witch has gone from 13 up to 41? Another reason. There must be another reason. And this other reason is the diastolic dysfunction. Okay, so probably this patient is having half PEF, and this is the diastolic dysfunction. One evidence of this diastolic dysfunction is the V wave. You look at the V wave here, compare it to the V wave before. The V wave indicates the venous retain and the pressure of venous retain. If the LA pressure is high, the V wave is going to be high. So during exercise, the V wave up is, is, is higher than the baseline, and the wedge is much higher than the baseline. So this is the aesthetic pressure problem. It has nothing to do with the mitral stenosis. Okay. Now, the most famous tracing in all exams. What is this? Anybody? You can take the constricted pericarditis because it's easier and describe what you see here in this part. Type, okay. In constricted pericarditis, usually the diagnosis is settled at the ecola. Rarely, if ever, we need to proceed further to disclose the hemodynamics of constricted pericarditis beyond echo data, fortunately. But sometimes you need in disputed cases when the diagnosis is not firmly confirmed in echo, you need to go for invasive hemodynamics. And this is how constricted pericarditis invasive hemodynamics look like. What you have is when the pressure in the LV goes low, the pressure in the RV goes high. When the pressure goes high in the LV, the RV pressure goes low. And if you take it in during inspiration, Inspiration is going to elevate the RV pressure because of more of blood coming to the right side. And simultaneously, it's going to drop the LV pressure. And during expiration, you have the reverse. So this is called discordance between the LV and the RV pressure. Discordance. Discordance. Because they are discordant. One increases, one decreases. Okay, this is constricted pericarditis. And why do we have this tracing? How could you explain it based on the pathophysiology? How could you explain it? During respiration, the vein is compressed by the pericardial effusion, so the venous uh, return to the heart will be decreased. Okay. Yeah. Due to interventricular dependence. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. This is what I'm looking for. You might elaborate on the mechanistic aspects of this constricted pericarditis, but the one I would like to hear from you is, the enhanced interventricular interdependence in constricted pericarditis. Enhanced means what? Means that one of the LV, one, one of, yeah, the, the RV depends on LV and LV depends on RV. 
They are not working simultaneously. So for the RV to fill, the LV underfill. For the LV to fill, the RV underfills. So this is the enhanced interventricular interdependence. Okay? And that's why you have this discordance. Now compare it with the constriction. The constriction. You go low, you go low. You go high, you go high. So this is what concordance. This is called concordance. Why do we have concordance in restrictive cardiomyopathy? Because there is no enhanced interventricular interdependence. We don't have it. Okay? But we have it in constriction. Mm -hmm. So this is the biggest discriminating feature between the two. Okay? Good. Now, for the Central venous pressure or jugular pressure, this is what you get. A, C, X, V, and Y. A stands for what? Atrial contraction. X stands for what? X is what? Sorry? So I Sorry. After the atrium contracts, what it does after that? It relaxes. Yes. So this is the atrial relaxation. Now, after atrial relaxation, the pressure builds up to the V wave. Why is this? So why do we have V? V means what? Because the atrium after relaxation starts filling. So the pressure increases. This is venous retained filling the right atrium or left atrium. Now, after the V wave, we have the Y. Why the Y? Rabbit filling of the Exactly. Mitral valve opens and blood goes out of the left atrium. That's why you have a drop in pressure to the Y. And then you have, after that, the A which is the atrial contraction, which increases the pressure in the left atrium, after which left atrial relaxation, after which left atrial filling, after which early emptying, after which early con uh, contraction, stuff like that goes on. Okay? So mm -hmm. now we know that. What about this weird wave, the so-called C? Why is this C? The bulk of the tricuspid valve in the left. Very, very good, very good. So from peak of A to the nadir of X, this is atrial relaxation after the contraction. It's relaxing. But this relaxation is interrupted momentarily by the bulge of the tricuspid annulus backwards into the right atrium during mid systole elevating the pressure only momentarily. So the C wave is due to the annular bulge, annular bulge, annular bulge. Okay, good. Now, this is the timing. Okay. Now, if you compare this one here. So, this is the normal jugular pressure. See, in constrictive pericarditis, I wish so much you focus on these because they are important. In constrictive pericarditis, what do we have? Describe what you see here in comparison to the normal jugular venous pressure. In prominent and Exactly. So, we have prominent. Y and X. The most important is the prominent Y leading clinically to the so-called precordial knock. The precordial knock is because of this prominent Y descent. Okay. In cardiac tamponade, we have what? We have prominent. deep X, but what about the Y? is blunted Y. The Y is blunted. Now, when we have severe tricuspid regurgitation, what are we seeing here? 
What do we see? Large V wave. Large V wave, very large. Not only that, we actually lost this part. This part which goes this way is lost. Because this part after the atrial contraction is supposed that the atrium is relaxing due to the uh, relaxing to the venous retake. But now the pressure increases because a lot of blood is coming through the mitral or the tricuspid regurgitation. So we are going to have an elevation right from the C wave. From the C wave, it doesn't relax to X. It goes from C to V. That's why they call it C V wave. C V wave. No longer there is X. It doesn't relax to X. It just relaxes a little bit and then increases uh, and then goes up to the V wave. So this is called C V wave, which is a sign of severe tricuspid regurgitation. Now in tricuspid stenosis here, what do we see? Large air wave. Exactly. So tricuspid stenosis leads to large air wave. A ASD. ASD here. What does it lead to? Equal C and A wave. Okay. <clears throat> and? Even the V wave more than exactly. The V wave is big. It's not as big in, as in, in, in TR, but it's also big. Why V wave is big in ASD? Because of... Uh, Equalization of the pressure between the two chambers, reflecting the and increase the flow. Are you what? Increase the flow exactly because the V wave is due to the venous retain, venous retain, while the left atrium is relaxing, is filling with blood. So whatever the source of filling of blood, caval blood, TR blood, ASD blood. Anything that comes on top of the venous retain is going to increase any additional source of venous retain, you know, or, or of, 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 of blood filling during atrial relaxation is going to increase the V. That's why in TR, you have this tremendous V wave. That's why in ASD, because it's left right shunt, it's gonna fill a lot and more than usual. That's why you have this stout V wave. Okay, now look at the complete AV block and explain to me this tracing. What are we seeing here? Jump air wave. Sorry? Jump air wave. Exactly. Why do we have giant air wave which are intermittent? Complete AV dissociation. Yes. Because you have complete AV dissociation, intermittently you might have an award, a, a, a atria contracting against a closed tricuspid valve. That's why you get giant A wave, canon, canon A wave. Canon A wave. These are canon A waves. Okay? Good. And in atrial fibrillation here, the only thing that we are going to miss is the A. We will not see A wave because A means atrial contraction, which is lost in AF. Okay. Now, the normal arterial pressure tracing is this one, and this is arterial stiffness. Can you describe this arterial stiffness? What do we have here? When you have arterial stiffness, you tend to have a higher systolic and a lower diastolic. Therefore, you are going to have a wider pulse pressure. Wider pulse pressure indicates, among other things, arterial stiffness. And this is because of lack of aortic recoiling properties or elastic properties due to the stiffness. So that's what you get. Now, 
these are arterial waveforms in different conditions. So look at the normal one. In the aortic stenosis, we said what we have is pulsus tardus parvus. Tardus parvus. Tardus and parvus. Parvus means is a Latin word, and tardus is a Latin word. Tardus means late or delayed. Parvus means small. So what we have is a small pulse, because it's a small pulse compared to this one. And we have it late. Any? See here the time from the onset and the time from the onset. So more time here. So that is pulses, tardus, parvus of severe aortic stenosis. Now in aortic regard, that's what we have. Vivid waveform. This is not the diacritic notch. The diacritic notch is down here. So what is this and what does it mean in AR? Balsas visiferance. Yes. Uh, what, what, why does it happen? Double apical balsas. Yeah. Why does it happen physiologically? Why? Because of... Um, increase in the... Increase in the flow. Backward flow, because of yes. increasing backward flow. Because what you are supposed to have is, at, as you are approaching the peak here, that's the peak. Then after that, you go down. The pressure is going to go down. But in AR, the pressure is going to increase because of the aortic gear going backward, increasing the pressure because of the reflection of the wave, big wave of pressure because of AR. So that's why it generates a double double peak like here, that is vivid pulse or pulse of which is aortic regurgitation. Look at the pulse in low stroke volume versus high stroke volume. What do we have? In low stroke volume pulse, you tend to have a narrow pulse, a steep downward and low diacrotic notch. I want so much, you know, these three characteristics of low stroke volume pulse. It's going to be narrow, steep down stroke, and low diacrotic notch. Three features of low stroke volume. Okay? Narrow, steep, low diacrotic notch. Good. Now, what is this? Pulses alternus. Very good. This is pulses or ternance here and here and here. So by invasive hemodynamics or by ultrasound echo, this is pulses or ternance. Look at the ECG. Does the ECG tell you anything? Nothing at all. They are equal, equal, equal. That's why don't confuse pulses or ternance with electrical or ternance. Okay. So pulses or ternance means what? Severe LV dysfunction. Severe LV systolic dysfunction. Great. Now, this is a comparison between pulses alternance and pulses paradoxes. Can anybody explain this to me? Pulses paradoxes? Uh, pulses paradoxes is drop. Uh, Sustain, uh, sustain increase in the JVB pressure. No, it's an arterial pressure. It's arterial pressure. Is there increase in the pulse pressure? Uh huh. When I measure in the pulse pressure, decrease in the pulse pressure during inspiration. Exactly. Decrease in blood pressure during inspiration because of tamponade, right? because of tamponade. Here, the pulse, you look at the pressure. That's expiratory pressure. Look at the inspiratory pressure. It goes so low. And again, expiratory pressure recovers. So this, during inspiration, the arterial pressure drops. So this is pulses paradoxus of severe of tamponade, okay? 
So the difference here between this one and this one, because it's a source of confusion, this is bit to bit, but this is respirophasic. Bit to bit, respirophasic. Okay? Good. Now, what is this? Okay. Uh -huh. What is this? This is electrical alternance. Electrical alternance. Is it electrical alternance? You agree? No, no, no. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Just a moment, I'm going to mute. Uh... So, uh, look here. High, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low. So this reminds you of what? Also. 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 Exactly. By the way, the ECG is not showing anything. It's not except this PVC here. Otherwise, the heights are okay. There is a bit of baseline artifact that's why the ECG has gone down like that and up like this but the heights of the QRS complex is similar okay so this is pulseless alternance now somebody guess about this this is RVRA pressure this is called simultaneous RVRA pressure so what's the problem There is uh, discordance. Uh, discordance, you probably is probably take take you to the uh, uh, NVRV, but this is RVRA, not not LV. RV RV right atrial pressure trace. The right atrial pressure tracing, like we have seen, usually there is E, A, X, V, and Y. But sometimes you don't see a lot of that. You see this wave. This one is what? This wave of the right atrial pressure. What is it? This is, is it? a V wave. Huh? V wave. V wave. V wave. Thank you so much. This is V wave. Exactly. It is V wave is systolic wave because we said that it's due to the venous retain or whatever retain to the right atrium during systole. So this is V wave. But is it normal or abnormal? It is high. Very good. It's very Gained high. V. Yes, it's giant V wave. Why? Uh, maybe either due to uh, due they to are. tricuspid regurgitation. Yeah, tricuspid or, something else. or something else. The V wave is increased due to many things. We said that it increased due to diastolic dysfunction. It increased because of AST. Okay, it increased because of VST in the left side. And it increased because of MR and TR. Lacking the metabga giant at this, that is regular. This is severe TR. And if you see it in the left side, that would have been severe MR. This is giant B wave. Okay. They sometimes call it ventricularization of the V wave. The V wave is catching up with the RV pressure. Okay, ventricularization of the V wave. So this is severe because you remember this one here. I showed you this one. You see the V wave here in PR. 
how big it is? That's the V wave. It's big. Okay, so that's what we are seeing it here. This is what we are seeing, the V wave. Okay, good. Now, uh, what is this? Somebody in the cash lab negotiating the left main, and this happens, and then he does something, and the second part happens. So what is this? This is ventricularization. And? Our and damping. Because it's not only ventricularized, but damping. The pressure has decreased, you know, decreasing the pressure. So this is damping and ventricularization. And this happens why? And if you are negotiating the left main or stuff like that, sometimes you might get against the wall. You are not so coexistent. So you might be against the wall. If you are against the wall, you are going to have ventricularization. Because if you are against the wall, the pressure is going to be taken from that. LV instead of from the artery. So you get ventricularization. Now you get damping when? Damping means actual drop in the pressure. This means that you have created an obstruction adding on the serious obstruction which is already there and you induce ischemia and the blood pressure decreases due to that. So damping is serious. That's why you have to hit and run. You have to do it so quick, so quick, okay? So this is damping and ventricularization. Ventricularization against the wall, damping is actual obstruction imposed by the catheter, okay? Now, what is this? First of all, if this is a single catheter or multiple catheters, i.e., Simultaneous or pullback? It's pullback. It is pullback. Right. Pullback from where? LV cavity to the LVOT to the aorta. Yes. What do we have? Dynamic obstruction. Why did you say that? There is a spike and dune at the level of the LVOT. Okay. And there is a median. Okay. Very good. Very good. LVOT. Very nice. So if you are pulling back, you have to specify the gradient is between which two parts. That's why we have LV, LV gradient, LV aortic gradient. Aortic, aortic gradient, remember these three, LV, LV gradient, LV aortic gradient, or aortic aortic gradient, okay? So now this pressure gradient is between what? LV, LV gradient, because the gradient appear between the LV and LV. So this is LV, LV gradient. This LV, mm -hmm. LV gradient is either due to dynamic obstruction of hookum or subaortic membrane. But you have chosen subaortic membrane because the waveform of the aorta is a spike and dome. It is a spike and dome, which is the right answer. But remember, subaortic membrane or subaortic obstruction leads to the same tracing, LV, LV. Good. Now, what is this? LV aortic, there is systolic, uh, the, uh, there is, this is pullback catheter from LV to the aorta, and there is systolic gradient between the aorta. Yes, Which very good. This so this is what, this is what aorto aortic gradient, the gradient is between aorta and aorta. 
the proximal aorta and a distal part of the aorta. Because here the LV, the LV, all through the LV, there was no problem. LV. Now we come here to the aorta. This is the aorta. Sobra. When we come to the initial part, the proximal part of the aorta, the tracing are here. When we come to the distal part of the aorta, the tracing are here. So the gradient is between a proximal part of aorta and a distal part of aorta. It's aorta aortic gradient. So what is this? Or 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 supraortic stenosis. Exactly. Exactly. Either coarctation or supraortic stenosis. Good. Now, what is this? The first one is LV. Mm -hmm. The second one is arterial pulse. It's still in the LV, but in the LVOT. So this part is LV. This oh. is LVOT. Spike this and is aorta. And this is the aorta. So the gradient is between which two parts? The LV, LV and the LVOT. Right? The gradient is here. It's between LV, LVOT. So what is this? Either subortic membrane or hookup. Right? With spike and dome. But with the spike and dome, you are inclined to hookup. Good. Hookup. Now look at these three. These are the full facts. Okay, so the three full facts we have seen. You go from the LV to the supravalvular chamber, which is the aorta, and to the aorta. So what is this? LV, that's the LV, we have no problem. The proximal aorta, we have no problem. Then a distal part of the aorta, we have a problem. Gradient. So this is aorta aortic gradient, and this means I have supraortic membrane, uh, supraortic stenosis or coactation. Now look at this one: LV, 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 LV. Then I come to the aorta, low gradient. So as I emerge out of the LV, I get a gradient. So this is a gradient between LV and aortic valve. So this is aortic stenosis, okay? Now look at this one, LV, LVOT, and aorta. I get the gradient between the LV and the LVOT. So this is LV, LV gradient that is either subaortic membrane or hookum. And it's most likely hookum because of the spike endo. Good. Now, this is a gradient, or I can give you this one. Look at here. This is a mitral stenosis gradient, shaded in blue, before and after intervention. You see, after intervention, we have some changes. Tell me about the changes after mitral ballooning. What are the changes here described in this one? Decrease the gradient between both. Significant decrease in the gradient. One, two. Decrease in the LA pressure. Three. Um, also decrease in the LV pressure. LV pressure, uh huh? And what about this one? Look at this part. V wave, V wave. Does it changes? The V wave? Yes, it's decreasing. And Yes, the V wave is high in, in, in mitral stenosis because of lack of compliance of the left atrium. So the venous retain is going to impose high pressure. But when you fix it, the V wave is going to drop. And this is the V wave drop. So in mitral stenosis, usually you look for the gradient, but also the V wave is going to go down, the V wave. Okay. Now, you know that in, in HFPF, and I'm going to dedicate a special presentation for uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the evaluation and the imaging part and all of that. But usually, in cases of HFPF, you could sort the diagnosis 
based on the initial clinical and echo data. Okay? But sometimes you fail. The patient is symptomatic and you are suspecting HFPF and the echo wasn't so helpful. So in this case, where are you gonna go? Where are you gonna go? Hemodynamic. hemodynamic. What do you mean by hemodynamic? Exercise hemodynamic. Yes. Okay, exercise hemodynamics. So remember this, this is in the guidelines by the way, okay? Diastolic stress test, diastolic stress test. Diastolic stress test. So if you are suspecting based on clinical data and initial echo data that the patient is a case of HFPF, but you fail to confirm the diagnosis based on initial echo or workup, you go for the diastolic stress test, either by echo or by cath. Usually by echo, but cath is also helpful. By echo, we exercise the patient and see the change in E over E prime. E over E prime, how it changes with exercise. As easy as that. This is our marker, E over E prime. Now, when we come to the invasive hemodynamics, what are we looking for? What are we looking for? The wedge pressure. Remember, because I'm going to ask you, if you have done for a patient, the aesthetic stress testing by echo, what is the marker you are going to look for? E over E prime. And if you have done invasive cat lab, what's the marker you are gonna look for? Pulmonary capillary wedge. So how the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is going to change before and after exercise. Okay, before and after. Good. So that's it for today. Thank you so much. Hopefully we have covered the vast majority of hemodynamics, invasive hemodynamics. And I think if you have questions, I'm ready.